Why do people choose to cooperate with each other? This is a large and growing field of inquiry, much of it now dominated by evolutionary sciences and complexity theory. Of course, if you believe in conventional economics and its rather crude reductionist idea of a human being, cooperation is an aberration, something that defies the logic of mar market culture. Economics is based on the idea of homo economicus, the selfish, rational, utility-maximizing individual, after all. By the lights of standard economics, it is not considered rational to share and cooperate with others because it's likely to decrease one's personal material advantages. We're presumed to be ruthlessly calculating individuals, always trying to figure out what's best for us as isolated individuals. There is, in fact, a whole literature of so-called prisoner dilemma experiments that purport to show how irrational it is to cooperate. Unfortunately, most of these experiments are rigged at the outset by the assumptions that they make about people. Test subjects have no shared social history, for example, and they're not allowed to communicate with each other. They can't develop bonds of trust and shared knowledge. And they're given only limited time and opportunity to learn to cooperate. Not surprisingly, this results in suboptimal tragedy of the, of the common scenarios, and life as a free-for-all is the, the lesson we take away from that. Fortunately, real life doesn't necessarily work this way. Nobel laureate Eleanor Ostrom studied countless commons in which people had come to see the virtues of cooperating with each other. They came to see how they could maximize both their personal gains as well as the collective good. You could say that uh, Ostrom helped break down the simple-minded dichotomy in economics that holds that we're either self-interested or altruistic. In real life, our self-interest often requires us to restrain ourselves in the best interest of the group. Is that selfish or altruistic? Sometimes we choose to make incredibly generous sacrifices for a group because it feels good or because it pleases our friends and family and indirectly gratifies us as individuals. Is that selfish or altruistic? I think the problem is the exclusive focus on the individual. While market-oriented economics likes to define us all as individuals and focus on individuals as the only significant agent in a market or a society, there is, in fact, a whole new wave of research today, especially among evolutionary scientists, sociologists, anthropologists, which suggests that group affiliation is arguably more important than individualism. These researchers argue that we are actually hardwired to cooperate with each other. That's because our identities and personal development are wrapped up in larger collectives. Reciprocal exchange lies at the heart of human identity, community, and culture. It's a vital brain function that helps the human species survive and evolve. Scientists are starting to discover that evolutionary advantages don't necessarily happen to individuals, but uh, often to collectivities or entire species. As E.O. Wilson and David Sloan Wilson put it, selfishness beats altruism within groups, but altruistic groups beat selfish groups. Other scientists believe that natural cooperation should be added as a third fundamental principle alongside um, mutations and natural selection in evolutionary theory. Because human beings are a cooperative species, one that has evolved through their reliance on reciprocal social exchange. Of course, all of this is talking at a rather high level of generality. The really interesting question is, what makes us in very specific circumstances act on behalf of narrow personal interests, and when are we willing to subordinate those interests to a larger collective interest? Certainly the political and legal institutions that we are born into matter. So do the property rights that a society adopts. These are kind of the baseline norm of what might be seen as socially appropriate. So some choices about individualism versus cooperation are decided for us in advance by the culture into which we are born. Our culture gives us cues about what we ought to believe and what we should aspire to. Our upbringing implants certain cultural perceptions, habits, and biases about whether we should cooperate with others or not. So we don't necessarily have a 
blank slate or open mind when choosing cooperation over personal gain. Academic researchers are increasingly trying to figure out how and when people will cooperate versus pursue individual advantages. Samuel Bowles, an economist and a complexity theory theorist, has devised a sophisticated multi-agent computer simulation program to test various scenarios that simulate when different types of individuals will cooperate or not. He created software agents that represent bourgeois individuals who defend what they own and try to acquire things for their private use, and another subgroup of sharers who share their resources with everyone, and finally, a subgroup of civic individuals who share only with other sharers and punish those who don't share. The purpose of the experiment was to figure out how group size or baseline allocations of resources and property rights affect people's willingness to share. It turns out that context and history matter a great deal in whether people will cooperate or not. And this suggests that one of the big issues in expanding the commons today is figuring out how we can overcome the biases of culture and history that may limit our potential. A big part of the challenge is understanding the circumstances in which cooperating and sharing really do work and provide a satisfying way to live.